Hello and welcome to the Nicola Wealth Real Estate Webinar 2022 Mid-Year Update. My name is Ethan Astonay and I'll be your host for today. Before we get started, some housekeeping items. At the end of the prepared questions today, we will have a Q&A and at any time during the discussion, you can submit a question. To do so, please locate the Ask a Question tool below the live feed. If you wish to add subtitles to today's discussion, you can do so by clicking the CC closed caption button in the video feed. If at any point you have questions for our team about how to use the platform or need help troubleshooting, you can use the same ask a question tool or for self-serve troubleshooting, there's a question mark at the bottom of the screen. Since today's webinar will be recorded, a replay will be made available and distributed, but I hope you stick around until the end as Mark will be announcing some upcoming real estate events in Vancouver and Toronto, and we hope to see you there. You can expect an invitation to that in your inboxes shortly following today's discussion. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce Mark Hanna, Managing Director of Real Estate at Nicola Wealth. Mark is a founding member of the real estate team, which formed in 2003, uh, and he's got over 40 years experience in real estate. Mark, thanks for joining us today. And it looks like you've got a canine companion in your corner. Yeah, uh, it's a replica of my dog, Ollie. And you know what? Even he's excited to be back in the office. He's keeping okay, an eye right on me today. <laughs> Great. Well, Mark, maybe we can just jump right into it. Can you start us off with an overview of the 2022 mid-year results for all of our funds and go maybe over your, your forward-looking projections for the balance of the year? Sure, happy to. So the um, second quarter uh, statements were distributed recently by email to our clients and the mid-year uh, returns for the three funds are shown on the screen. But let me uh, start with the Canadian fund uh, first. Um, it recorded 11% return year to date for mid-year 2022. Uh, this is a great result. Uh, at the midway point, uh, we added five new acquisitions. Uh, there are a number of reasons for the strong performance. Firstly, our fund performance of multifamily, rental apartment, industrial, self-storage, and creative office in key growth markets such as Vancouver and Toronto, they're, they're continuing to pay off for us. And secondly, our uh, Nicola Wealth real estate team was able to achieve some outstanding results with rental income growth for essentially all our assets uh, that I described above. These factors all contributed to these, this impressive result. So looking forward for the Canadian fund, We'll, we will continue with our strategy on fund composition in the key markets. Uh, we do expect the acquisition velocity to slow in the second half uh, to be conservative. Uh, we are projecting our returns to year end 2022 to be somewhere in the, and this is conservative, somewhere in the 12 and a half to 14% range, which outperforms our five year average of 11.1%. Moving on to the US income fund that recorded a 13.7% return year to date for mid year 2022. This is an excellent result. At the midway point, we added 11 new acquisitions. The revenue growth um, and, and valuation increases for our multifamily rental apartment portfolio uh, in partnership with Ventera has continued the momentum from the last half of 2021 and it's carried forward into the first half of 2022. To complement the strategy, we've been aggressively acquiring, as I mentioned in our last webinar, um, and or building new small bay to mid bay industrial distribution product in, in our key target markets in the US being Phoenix, Denver, Vegas, Dallas, Seattle, and Minneapolis. And then similar to our Canadian um, income fund, this, this strategy is starting to pay big dividends as we are benefiting from healthy tenant demand and strong income growth from industrial users in these markets. We are also building a self storage portfolio in the US starting with Denver, uh, leveraging off the success of our advanced self-storage uh, portfolio in our Canadian fund. So looking forward for the U.S. fund, uh, we will continue with the strategy on multifamily with our partner Ventera, and we will continue with our pursuit of uh, buying, acquiring existing uh, industrial or building new industrial in those target markets. We do expect the acquisition velocity to slow somewhat in the second half, um, our conservative projection uh, for returns to the end of 2022 is in that 15 to 16% range, which is significantly higher than the five-year average of 12.5%. And finally, the value add fund, it recorded 11.6 return year to date uh, for mid-year 2022. This is also a great result. 
the first half of 2022 continued to be very active as we added 12 new acquisitions for this fund. So as of mid-year 2022, we have 69 projects in that uh, fund for a total AUM assets under management of 838 million and have several more deals in the pipeline to close by year end. We've added some new strategic partners for this fund and some exciting new markets. We're privileged to have many existing quality development partners who we will continue to scale with on new projects. So looking forward, uh, we've built a great stable of quality partners for asset types, such as small bay industrial, rental apartment buildings, land entitlement, residential condo, industrial repositioning, to name a few. And we will continue with these strategies. Our, our conservative projection for returns to the end of 2022 is in that 14 to 15 and a half percent range, which will be in line with our more optimistic and we are targeting um, for to, to match our five-year average of 15.2%. Uh, so on the screen is uh, is a summary of the uh, of the high-level metrics. Those are great results, Mark. Thank you, and very encouraging on the outlook. Maybe we can unpack uh, that a little bit and talk about appraisals and valuations. How do those get impacted in a rising interest rate or uh, a recessionary environment? So. The short answer is yes, valuations will be impacted by a higher interest rate environment, but it's not, it is not necessarily impact returns in the same way. This is the number one question asked over the last few months by our clients to their advisors. So let me try and explain. Since our last webinar in February of this year, the Bank of Canada rate has jumped 225 basis points. It was last February at 25 basis points, and now it's at 2.5. Um, basis points. Plus, there's another threat of a 75 basis point increase in September. However, that may reduce to only 50 if inflation is tempered. This would top out by 3.25% by December of this year. So to help put this in perspective, the conventional five-year mortgage all-in borrowing rate, depending on the asset class and market, in February uh, at our last webinar, was in the range of 2.5 to 3.5%. That was the borrowing interest rate. Whereas today, the five-year all-in borrowing rate is in the 4.75 to 5.5% range. That is a pretty significant change in a short time period. As a result of the interest rate increase, the cap rates for certain asset types have started to adjust upwards, but not all assets and markets are treated the same. So for example, industrial, multifamily rental apartment, and self-storage assets, which we have a lot of, the cap rates have not had a material impact, whereas say office towers or shopping centers, which we have very few or any of, they have experienced an increase in cap rates. The other interesting fact, um, if we can do a bit of a history review, is if you look back to the 1980s and the 1990s, and uh, as Ethan referenced, I've been in the business 40 years, so I'm old and I've had seen a lot of cycles, the, the the positive leverage did not exist in those time periods. In fact, for most of those time periods, the interest rate was sometimes equal or in some periods much higher than the cap rates, eliminating any opportunity for positive leverage. Then for most of the past 20 years, so in, in the 2000s, we have been spoiled with positive leverage where there has been a two to 300 basis points spread between the cap rate and the borrowing rate, creating a very attractive investment environment. So there's no question that real estate owners and investors, including our three real estate funds, have benefited from low, lower interest rates over the past few years. Our Nicola Wealth real estate team has been planning for this moment, as we knew eventually that interest rates would not stay low forever. The key to counterbalance rising interest rates was to structure our leases with built-in annual growth. And that's going to be a consistent theme you're going to hear from me today. Our team has been very successful at not only securing annual growth, a 3.3 to 5% per annum. They've also achieved much higher rents on rollover at maturity or for vacant space. We only seek to buy properties where our team can work their magic and make a material impact on the net income growth. We will not acquire properties where the rates are fully baked or above market, eliminating any opportunity for income growth. As mentioned in our last webinar, our real estate team switched from annual to quarterly valuations of all our assets. This change was made to sure, ensure that 
the valuations were current and fair to provide a more accurate NAV, which means net asset value. This means that every month we value one third of our entire portfolio. We have examined the valuations carefully from our third party appraisers in this environment where almost all the property value increase in 2022 has come from net income growth as opposed to cap rate compression, which happened in 2021. The net income growth has been significant and this has served us well to counterbalance rising cap rates uh, in a higher interest rate environment. Um, this can be attributed, in my, my opinion, to the fund composition with the right asset types in the right markets. Um, we also believe that assets in our funds will be less impacted by um, rising interest rates. What that means today is that we are in a zero leverage, uh, in some cases, negative leverage environment. At this point in time, we do not see cap rates rising two to 300 basis points or two to 3% above the five year all in borrowing mortgage rate. Also, we are following the market closely on sales transactions to identify any signs of adjusting cap rates. And up to this point, there have been very few data points to, to suggest that any significant change is occurring. Um, we acknowledge that cap rates will rise, but not dramatically for the asset types and markets in our portfolio. We learned a lot uh, during COVID where fund composition really mattered in terms of rent collection, where we achieved 98%, which is phenomenal. Current economic cycle is much different, but some of the same elements apply where having the right assets and the right markets will produce strong results. Thanks, Mark. That's helpful to have that historical context and uh, also to hear about the prudent use of, of debt and the, and the nuances about that. Can we talk a little bit about acquisitions, which you commented on earlier? How is the current environment, you know, inflation is running high, threat of a recession, how does this impact uh, the team as it relates to acquisitions? So um, the Bank of Canada was likely too late to increase uh, interest rates. They should have really started in Q4 of 2021. So now they're playing a bit of catch up with some aggressive rate hikes that we have rarely seen to help slow or stop inflation. So the good news is the Bank of Canada now actually has something to work with to help stimulate the economy in the future once inflation is under control. And there are some small bright spots that suggest inflation is possibly slowing over the past few weeks. So in terms of how this impacts our strategy going forward for acquisitions, there is no question that we're being very patient and deliberate in this environment. Uh, we've pumped the brakes over the past three to four months, knowing that higher interest rates were on the horizon. However, we are not totally uh, pens down and out, out of business. Um, as we are still underwriting and acquiring smaller deals that are accretive to our portfolio. And we'll, we'll continue to monitor the market closely for attractive opportunities and pounce when the time is right. As we have stated on many of our past webinars, interest rates influence cap rates and they play an important role in the pricing guidance by the brokers on behalf of sellers. Our real estate team uh, will remain disciplined on our investment criteria, which includes concentrating on the key major markets and acquiring assets in strong nodes and that particular city. Um, we also look for assets with good bones, so um, offering good utility that will appeal to a wide range of users. And, and most importantly, we focus on properties where the in-place rents are below market, allowing um, our skilled in-house leasing and asset management team to add value and grow the revenue. Um, if we can execute on the strategy and grow the revenue with built-in annual rent escalations, this serves as a great counterbalance to rising interest rates where cap rates might be influenced to trend up. So our team is not scared of rising interest rates. The market is often slow to adjust and may have limited impact due to the surplus of capital looking to be deployed. Um, some investors, early investors in our, our funds when we first started back in the Canadian fund in 2003, might remember that cap rates were eight to nine percent and interest rates were six percent. The common theme being is that there's typically a two to three percent spread between the interest rates and cap rates, creating a very attractive uh, environment and opportunity for, for positive leverage. However, we could be entering an environment for the next uh, short while where we do not benefit from positive leverage as cap rates may stay equal or remain below the all in boring rate, meaning no leverage or in some instances, for the quality assets, negative leverage. 
bottom line is that we have an experienced real estate team who can make adjustments to changing environments and still achieve favorable outcomes. And we have proven that once again, as evidenced by our strong returns in 2022. We also believe there'll be some interesting opportunities in the coming months from owners who are undercapitalized and either need to bring in a partner or sell at favorable terms. Uh, we're building up cash reserves and keeping our powder dry to take advantage of these potential opportunities. And Ethan on the screen here is a slide illustrating the volatility of the interest rates over the past few years. That's a, that's a really helpful uh, explanation and breakdown, Mark. Thank you. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, just the fact that the the funds have been growing. I think uh, on an earlier screen, if we converted that U.S. fund to Canadian dollars and added it all up, we're, we're approaching eight billion dollars in in gross assets there. So, can you talk a little bit about uh, you know managing the team and the asset base as it grows to such a large level? Yeah, it's grown very fast, and obviously, 2021 was a huge year for us, and we did close to 2 billion in acquisitions and it was a, it was, and it's carried over into this year. So our, our uh, in-house real estate team is now close to 60 people. Most of them are based in our downtown Vancouver office, but we also have two team members in Toronto and one in Seattle. So as our portfolio grows towards the 10 million uh, gross asset level and beyond, I can envision our team reaching a hundred people. And as I said, I've mentioned in many past webinars, Real estate does not run on its own. You need to pay attention to the detail and you need a skilled team to achieve the right outcomes for our investors. And I say this constantly to our team, all the little wins along with the big wins, they all add up during the year to a final result. And our real estate team has worked incredibly hard, especially since COVID in April of 2020, when there was a lot of fear and uncertainty in the market. Our team stepped up, uh, delivered great outcomes, achieving 98% rent collection. Even with the 2% we granted relief on, we collected most of that, uh, that relief. So now we're heading into another potentially stressed environment with rising interest rates, but our team has been planning and are ready for this moment. Our portfolio was built well and has benefited from strong asset management. Our, our real estate team is, has got a very deep bench and a wide range of expertise that includes finance, acquisition, leasing, asset management, debt procurement, self-storage, insurance, and development specialists. The, the deep bench is critical in running an $8 billion portfolio. And as our team is faced with multiple decisions on a daily basis, that requires, that requires a lot of communication and collaboration between the specialty teams, as all major decisions are really made by a consensus with input from the key stakeholders on our team to ensure we get the right outcomes. And finally, I've said this before and I'll say it again, uh, our employees at on both on our Nicola Wealth real estate team and at Nicola Wealth firm, a, a lot of the employees are are invested in our three real estate funds, which I believe promotes a really strong alignment with our investors. Uh, thanks for that, Mark. It's it's great to hear uh, you know a little bit about the team structure and the dynamic, but also really liked hearing you say that we were prepared for prepared for this and preparing for this. Maybe we can switch a little bit to dispositions of assets. Do we ever sell real estate in our income funds? And can you give us some recent examples? Sure. Um, the answer is yes, we do sell assets in our income funds. So while we have a clear investment strategy in terms of geography and asset type, strategies and criteria will change over time. Uh, we're constantly evolving as we grow. Um, so even though our income funds are evergreen open-ended funds that were designed to keep these assets long-term, we do believe it's prudent to sell assets that might no longer meet our investment criteria, or there is no further room to improve the asset. So the formula for successful real estate investing is a combination of growing the revenue through strong leasing and asset management and refinancing to allow for recapitalization and reamortization of the asset to help deliver an attractive leverage return for our investors. Our asset management team undertakes a full review of the entire portfolio on a semi-annual basis with, with over 300 properties and growing, you can imagine that is a fairly large undertaking, but necessary. In that review, uh, our asset management team identifies properties that may be suitable for disposition for various reasons, including geography, size, asset type, or future cash flow performance. So while we generally do not sell that often, we do believe it is good discipline to call the portfolio from time to time. 
In determining whether to sell an asset, the question we ask ourselves is, would we still buy that asset today, regardless of price? If the answer is no, and we can sell the asset at or above our NAV, we will execute on that disposition strategy. So on the screen here is a sample of uh, five dispositions that have uh, occurred in uh, 2022, in the first half. Okay, that's uh, that's really helpful to know that, uh, you know, maintaining that discipline is, is, uh, is still in place there. Maybe we can talk a little bit, and you alluded to this earlier, uh, about leasing strategy. And we, we talked about this when we were preparing as well for this discussion and how important that is for securing cash flow and growing revenue. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about that and you know, uh, the impact of rising rates and, and inflation and the fear of recession? Sure, so my background in brokerage, I started my career in leasing, so I know how important leasing is to an asset. And as I've stated, stated many times, cash flow is king. And it, and it is with our portfolio. And the number one priority that I say to our team is keep the assets leased. Um, but there's a lot more than that as we have put emphasis on leasing to make sure we get the right tenant profile, the right covenant with properly structured leases with built-in rental growth. And this proved to be very important during COVID and will once again prove to be really critical in this high interest rate environment. We made a strategic move four years ago to hire two highly skilled leasing specialists who work closely with our many talented asset managers. Together, those teams uh, have made a material impact on the outcome, specifically significant income growth. So tenant retention is very important and it's critical to the return on our funds. Um, and as I've stated before, we view our tenants as our partners. They, they work there every day. They know the asset better than we do. Uh, we want our tenants to succeed and this is why our asset management team needs to be better than just average. Our team needs to strive to be best in class team. And that includes ensuring we have strong relationships with our tenants. Also working with the real estate brokerage community, community is very important. And we strive to treat them with respect and pay them fairly. We don't like vacancy, but we're not afraid of it as we are confident the assets we acquire are situated in strong geographic nodes that will appeal to a wide range of users that should always command strong interest from tenants. We specifically target properties for acquisition that feature quality tenants where our team can execute on their value add and grow the revenue. So in terms of impact on rents during an inflationary environment or potential recession, we do not, we have not yet seen any material negative impact on rental rates. In fact, it's the reverse, they're going up and they continue to be strong for many of our assets, including our industrial properties, our self-storage, our the apartment buildings, and even our single level um, uh, office uh, asset types. So this is very good news as it helps counterbalance any rise in cap rates. Okay, that's really interesting to uh, uh, to know that, you know, the inflation that we hear about is actually translating into increased cash flow uh, on the rent side. Maybe we can talk about the other side of the uh, of the cash flow ledger and, and dig into uh, debt utilization a little bit more. Can you talk a little bit more about that uh, in terms of the strategy in the first half of the year, the go forward strategy, and specifically how does this impact renewals, acquisitions, development projects? Debt plays a very important part of of real estate investing, and um, so but the debt market has changed considerably over the last three months, where the major lenders are now being very selective in the borrowers, so they're tightening the screws. Um, the lenders, um, with the borrowing terms that are changing, where leverage used to be fifty five to sixty five percent, is now forty five to fifty percent LTV, which means loan to value. So that's a big change for undercapitalized groups. This means more equity will be required by investors in addition to providing a quality covenant. So this works to our advantage. Um, our real estate team uses debt responsibly to help produce attractive leverage return for our investors. And our high acquisition volume and track record has made us very appealing to the financial institutions, which helps us negotiate attractive terms. So you can imagine with over 300 properties, there's a high volume of financing for land loans, construction loans, new acquisitions, renewals. There, there's a lot of work for our team. And that's why we have a three person in-house debt team. That's all they do is manage our debt portfolio. While the procurement process on interest rates and, and length of term are important, 
there are other considerations such as the covenants, uh, the insurance, the reporting obligations. Those are all of equal importance. Having these specialists on our real estate team is essential to managing the high volume of mortgages and achieve uh, great outcomes for our clients. So with the anticipation of rising interest rates, our debt team went on the offense at the end of 2021 to be defensive by identifying existing properties where we have executed value add revenue enhancement and renewing mortgages two to three years in advance, anticipating rates going up. Um, at So we, we renewed those two to three years in advance at the lower interest rates for properties that had a lower early penalty payout. Um, the strategy allowed us to recapitalize and reamortize the assets, contributing to an enhanced financial return for many assets. Um, we also purposely stagger all of our mortgage maturities over seven to 10 years so that we're not over, overly exposed in any one particular year. And as we go forward, we will take advantage of the recent relative easing of bond rates by continuing to refinance and de-risk selected investment properties. We'll, we'll continue maintaining a diversified approach to balanced fixed and variable rate exposure for the loan book and extending and maximizing amortization periods where available to strengthen property cash flow. And finally, uh, proactively sourcing construction and pre-development financing where applicable to replace existing land loans. And on the screen here, uh, it illustrates uh, a few examples. It just happened to be self-storage. Um, a few examples of some refinancing that was done by our team that uh, um, created some uh, great outcomes. That's great. It, you know, it sounds like it's prudent, but also strategic the way that we're uh, using debt. And it's great to hear that. Uh, can we talk a little bit about build to own, which is something that we've addressed in the past as being part of our strategy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, that within our income funds and why that's important to our returns? Yeah. So um, our real estate team uh, made a decision about five years ago to, to develop build own assets for our own income funds. Um, it's really difficult for us to acquire new product at retail pricing and make those acquisitions accretive to our funds. So in order to achieve this goal, we assembled an in-house development team to execute on this strategy. And that team is really acts as a development manager working with the architects and the construction managers. So it's a real team effort. Um, but the build to own uh, strategy, it allows our real estate team to create value and provided you build the, the safe assets in the right location. You, you cannot re replicate those same returns if you try to acquire them new and shiny at retail pricing. It does, doesn't work for our funds. So the types of safe assets we are building include multifamily rental apartment buildings, self-storage under our advanced self-storage brand, uh, industrial distribution buildings, and single story or flex uh, creative office buildings. We've built up an impressive inventory of future development sites through our covered land play strategy in, in many key cities. And that will provide a, a large pipeline for future development when the time is deemed appropriate to develop those properties. Um, with, with this strategy, we now have accumulated a large land inventory for our development pipeline, but with the added benefit of strong holding income while we plan for the next generation of that property. And, on the, and finally, on the topic of rising costs, there's no question that the entire real estate industry has experienced some stress of late with rising um, labor and material costs, um, supply chain issues, and of course, rising interest rates. However, over the past month, and perhaps in line with my earlier inflation comments, I think we're starting to see some positive signs of, of improved pricing on labor materials. And with some luck, we might get some relief on interest rates in 2023 2023, neither Q1 or Q2. So I'm optimistic that mm -hmm. maybe we're turning the corner, but we still got a ways to go. And on the screen here, um, Ethan has some examples of some of our build to own projects that we have. And I think we have 20 or 21 underway, but these are just a, a random sampling of um, the various asset types. Uh, you, uh, thanks for that, Mark. You talked a little bit about building materials. And so maybe we can go next to environmental, social governance issues, which are gaining attention from the perspective of the requirements of teams to have a policy or a clearer policy in this regard. So can you talk a little bit about how our team is positioned? You know, how does net zero carbon figure into the future of say built to hold projects? 
Yeah, this is an important topic and it's definitely not going away. So for everybody's benefit, ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. Um, so for large companies such as Nicola Wealth, this is a priority at all levels. And this trickles down to the three real estate funds. Um, we do have a formal ESG policy for our real estate. However, we're in the process of refining that to make it more robust and in keeping with, and in keeping with the ever-changing standards and, and, and measurements. Um, this will include all existing properties where we can implement changes to affect material measurable savings. This will also apply to new build to own projects where we can make immediate impacts. So the term net zero carbon is also part of the ESG conversation and it's gathering momentum. So for any new buildings, the new building code helps achieve 90% of that target. However, the residual to reach that 100% of that target could be items such as triple glaze windows versus double glaze, uh, rooftop solar panels, uh, electric instead of gas, just to name a few examples. And these are these are major um, changes to implement. And so they may sound simple, but they also have a cost attached. And this topic is very fluid and it's changing rapidly. So at this point in time, there's probably more questions than answers. So for example, um, what is a known at this juncture is will tenants pay more to be in a net zero carbon building? Can they achieve cost savings? And if so, over what time period? Will investors pay a better cap rate to acquire net zero buildings? The answer is yes, maybe, and I don't know. So all the above. Um, we can all agree that these changes are likely better for the environment to help fight climate change. However, my opinion is that more education on this topic is required uh, to everyone, including uh, building owners, uh, tenants, investors, developers, and the like. So Nicola Wealth Real Estate and the firm, that we want to be a good corporate citizen and do our part, but we're also moving cautiously and responsibly until we have more facts on the costs and the outcomes. And then this slide here on the screen just shows some of the topics I touched on. That's great, Mark, and uh, great to get an update on what is otherwise an evolving issue. Um, maybe we can go uh, to the income funds next and talk about, just acknowledge the tremendous growth. And can you expand on the asset classes and markets that the team is targeting? How do you think the values for those various asset classes will be impacted, say over the next two to three years? Uh, sure, and and as I mentioned, you know, 2021 was a very big year for us, and constantly looking at our strategy and portfolio, and and what markets and asset class we want to pursue. So let let me just touch on the Canadian Income Fund first. So we're really bullish on several key markets, and the obvious ones are Toronto, and Vancouver. Uh, the, yes, they're the most expensive, but that's where we've made the best returns. But we also like s several other secondary markets such as Victoria, Nanaimo and Kelowna. Those are easy to follow because they're in our backyard and we like those markets a lot and they're a good size. Calgary and Edmonton, uh, we're still interested in and we still have positions. Um, and even Winnipeg are important where we have industrial assets, but we're going to be really selective on the asset type in those markets. Uh, new markets to our fund include Montreal and hopefully in the, in the near future, um, Ottawa as well. So in terms of asset classes for, for a Canadian fund, we've built up an impressive portfolio of industrial assets and will continue with that strategy as they are generally located in a low vacancy rate markets with minimal capital outlay. Um, we are building new rental apartment product in several markets, including Vancouver and Victoria, and we're gonna look at other markets to expand with that asset type. Uh, we will continue to acquire and build low rise office or single story office in certain markets. Um, the self-storage asset class is off the radar for many investors, but yet plays a very important role in our Canadian income fund. Currently, we have nine self-storage properties. All of them are in BC, and the plan is to grow that to 25 properties over the next three to four years. Uh, this includes our first two in the Toronto market, which will be under our build-to-own program starting shortly. So the decisive advantage we enjoy is that we have a, an experienced uh, in-house management team for our advanced self-storage platform. And even more important, we have a passionate and engaged team of people on the front line who interact with customers to achieve excellent occupancy and income results. Uh, this asset class is not only real estate, but it's an active business and you need an engaged team to get the desired results. And this talented team is gonna help us scale and build the portfolio up across Canada. 
So for the U.S. In, uh, US income fund, uh, we are pursuing uh, multiple strategies. So firstly, starting with our long-standing partnership with Ventura since 2007, we built up an impressive multifamily apartment portfolio in the South and Southeast U.S., and that continues to outperform. We are fully committed to this strategy and with this partner, and we believe there's many more opportunities at attractive terms in an environment where several buyers are on the sidelines due to lack of capital or poor covenant. So the playing field for this asset class, it's been very crowded over the past two years. So the timing for us is very opportunistic. The other strategy um, is with industrial and the six primary target markets I've mentioned being Seattle, Minneapolis, Phoenix, Vegas, Denver, and Dallas. We're looking at expanding to other markets for industrial, such as Nashville, Salt Lake, Austin, and Reno. These are all tax-friendly environments that have feature low vacancy rates and strong tenant demand. Uh, we're, we're either acquiring existing industrial properties with value add potential, or we're developing new build own product. Um, and we're also acquiring iOS sites, which is code for industrial outside storage. And these are typically located in prime infill um, locations featuring strong holding income. The reason we like the iOS industrial sub asset class is that they're typically in high demand from tenants and in infill locations, and they require a low capital outlay. Plus they provide an attractive pipeline for future development for our traditional industrial uh, distribution buildings. And uh, we also are pursuing self storage asset class in the US, starting with Denver, we have a proven partner we're working with we're really skilled at site acquisition, development, and lease up. And we expand, uh, we are anticipating to, uh, I think we have four now in that market, and we're anticipating to expand this asset class to some of the other US markets we're currently invested in. And finally, um, our team is active with multifamily build to own for our own account in the Seattle market, where we have three excellent sites that are at various stages of development or planning that are all located on transit line stations. A great breakdown, uh, Mark. It sounds like the, the strategy geographically is specific to asset class. And so a lot of critical thought has clearly been put into the income funds. Can we now talk about, you know, maybe the value add fund, which is eight years old uh, and has almost 70 properties in it, uh, you know, about 840 million in assets. So. How has the strategy evolved with respect to our real estate partners, asset types, geographies, and that fund? Yeah, the value add fund is now in its eighth year and it's really developed a solid track record. And this is a pure merchant fund where we either build and sell or repurpose and sell. And mm -hmm. while the equity multiple is an important and interesting metric, the primary focus um, for our team is the project IRR, which is time weighted. Um, this is a good discipline and it is how we are measured by our investors. Therefore, time is really your enemy if a project takes longer to complete. Um, our strategy over the past few years is adjusted where we have we are really focusing on very specific uh, developments types, such as small bay industrial, strata, condo, uh, industrial mid bay for lease, uh, multifamily rental apartment building, repositioning, uh, industrial, uh, portfolio where we can buy the bulk and sell the pieces and land and density entitlement. What we have learned is selecting the right partners is very important to have alignment. And we have been really fortunate to have some excellent partnerships in, in many of these markets. And on this slide, it just, we've given a few examples here of the, of the different um, asset types that I identified. That's great. Uh, thanks for that breakdown. Mark, maybe we can look ahead and, and talk a little bit high level. What are the biggest threats and opportunities you see for the balance of 2022 and beyond? So there's threats and speed bumps. They exist in any environment, um, but there's also opportunities that come with that. So I guess I'm an eternal optimist and glass is half full, but um, not many people anticipated the economy would recover so quickly from the outset of COVID in March of 2020, where the markets then exploded in the latter half of 2020 and then carried over into 2021 and even into this year with a tsunami of acquisitions and, and certainly great outcomes for for our, um, our clients. However, looking forward for the balance of 2022 and beyond, we do see threats 
for uncertainty, and it really stems in the debt markets. Uh, and these are things I've mentioned already today. The chain supply, still still a concern, and then labor and materials. Um, we have been spoiled with record low interest rates over the last number of years, and with relative ease to accessing debt. Um, this has changed very quickly. Where financial institu- financial institutions are now, they're being really selective on who they lend to in this current environment. Um, the other major concern continues to be both, and I've said this before, is the municipal, provincial, and federal government. The red tape is is just exhausting. They all talk a good story about wanting new supply of rental apartments and housing, but they're all working at cross purposes, and they're very good at finger pointing. The only way we're going to get things done is that all three of these levels need to get in the same room and work together. In the U.S., it's different. Um, they seem to have this figured out because um, the governments are working collaboratively, and we're seeing a lot of our new products getting to market much sooner. Um, so in terms of opportunities, um, our real estate team can prosper in this high interest rate, high inflation environment. We're already seeing attractive opportunities for that are coming our way, uh, and we expect that to happen for the balance of the year for undercapitalized owners or projects where we can potentially acquire a partner on. Um, we're also keeping our powder dry to build up cash reserves for this very reason. Um, and we did the very same thing during COVID. Um, and then, as mentioned earlier, under my debt comments, uh, I think this will work to our advantage due to our, due to our track record of performance when dealing with lenders for new acquisitions. That's great. Uh, n- nice to know that these things are keeping you up at night, Mark, so that, uh, uh, you know, there's there's experience on the team tackling these issues as well, which is something that you've talked about. Um, uh, with that in mind, where can clients uh, and attendees today go to stay informed about our real estate funds? Sure. So we have the main Nicola Wealth website for the firm, and there is a tab there that you can click on real estate. But we also have our own real estate that you can go right directly to, which is real estate nicolawealth.com and that website um, has our quarterly reports it has all our recent acquisition announcements it has any past webinar recordings any sort of newsletters but more importantly it has an entire it has a summary of our entire real estate portfolio by market and asset type and fund so it's all there for you Uh, that's great mark and you know, at the onset of the discussion, I mentioned you would be telling us a little bit about the in-person events we'll be having in Vancouver and Toronto. So uh, can you can you give us more information about those? Sure. Um, we're really excited about this and, and uh, there'll be invitations going out shortly, but um, we are hosting a real estate panel similar to what we did three years ago. And there'll be one in Vancouver and one in Toronto. And just briefly, the one in um, Vancouver will be on... Um, Thursday, September 22nd. We'll be at the same venue at the convention center, the new convention center. And we'll have an introduction by David Sung. And then I will be doing a fireside chat with uh, Kevin Falcon, leader of the um, opposition party. And to talk really about housing issues and related relating to real estate. Following that chat, uh, we'll have a, we have a panel of really talented people. We have Shanur, I'm sorry, Shanur, I get your name, pronounce your name wrong, right, Javji, sorry, at Lotus Capital. We've got Eric Carlson, who's always entertaining, at uh, Anthem Properties. We've got John Stavell from Reliance Properties. We've got Remco Dahl from Quadwheel. So four really experienced, talented uh, real estate experts, that'll be, and I'll be uh, fac- facilitating that discussion. And then for uh, the one in Toronto, that is on Wednesday, September the 28th, and that will be at the Globe and Mail building in the downtown east. And um, again, that will be uh, started off with by David Sung with an introduction. And then there'll be an economic overview by John Nicola. And then there'll be a panel discussion that'll be facilitated by myself. And on that panel, we have Adam Lazier from Northbridge Capital. We have Jamie McKenna. She's with Vengate Asset Management. We have Elias Constantopoulos. All oh, these names are killing me. At Great Golf, sorry, Elias. And Ugo, Ugo Bezario at Hazelview Investment. So um, a great lineup for both uh, venues, and we're excited about that. So invitations will be going out shortly. That's really exciting. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, we've got uh, some great questions in the Q&A and we're going to spend the next 16 minutes working through as many of those as we can, if that works for you. So we'll jump right into that. 
Um, the first one is uh, uh, the housing market has been getting a lot of attention in the press with reports of falling prices. Why is commercial real estate performing differently? Well, my opinion is that the housing market is a lot more volatile um, and partly due to the fact that most investors um, uh, are house owners um, and they occupy the house. Um, it has a lot more emotion than, say, commercial assets. Houses also typically have a higher uh, debt loan to value ratio, making these asset, making this asset class much more sensitive to interest rate adjustments. Um, also with housing, I think there's a lower barrier to entry. Uh, whereas and less sophistication are required. Uh, whereas with say commercial, there's a lot more skilled participants acquiring assets for investment pur purposes, and and they know how to financially engineer the their their acquisitions. Uh, very helpful. Uh, the next one uh, it seems someone's been following our fund. So in the past, the Canadian real estate fund held 33% in Alberta. Now it's down to 10%. Can you discuss this change in the plans for Alberta going forward? Yeah, we still like Alberta a lot and we want Alberta to succeed, um, but we're only interested in certain asset types in that market. So when the price of oil dropped in around 2015 timeframe, it went from 100, whatever, $100 a barrel down to 20. And there was panic and headlines and the phone calls came in from our clients to our advisors. And at the time, at that time, our exposure to Alberta was 33%. And fast forward today, as you noted, Ethan, it's now 10%. Um, and the interesting thing is during that time period back in, you know, a few years ago, those assets still performed and we had rent collections. So there was not an issue. It's just that our investors were nervous about the exposure due to the economy there um, that relies so heavily on oil. So while we did sell a few assets, um, in Alberta that were accretive to our fund. The primary reason for our exposure reducing from 33 down to 10, it's, it's, it's not because we sold a lot of assets. It's really because um, the rest of the portfolio grew in with our large acquisition of vol volume, especially in Toronto and Vancouver. Um, there's no question the office market in Calgary and Edmonton, it's still struggling and it's gonna take a really long time for that to recover, which is unfortunate. Um, our industrial is outperforming in those markets and we will continue to pursue those assets in, in Alberta. <clears throat> we also are going to continue with our multifamily rental apartment and possibly self storage in the future in Alberta. Uh, thanks for that, Mark. We've got another uh, geography question. You touched on this a little bit, uh, aside from greater Vancouver and greater Toronto markets, what other areas in Canada appeal to you? Yeah, as I mentioned before, Vancouver and Toronto, they, they are the most expensive markets, but they are actually been really good to us. And they've outperformed for several asset classes, so we're not going to stop. Obviously, we're going to be very careful and, and deliberate, but uh, we're not going to stop um, in those areas. But markets of interest um, on our radar screen are certainly Ottawa and, of course, Montreal, which we've already made a, a plunge into and where we've made some recent acquisitions. So we want to build up our base uh, to lever off our cluster strategy. Uh, we don't like to own just one or two assets. We like to own a number of them so that we can really have a, a focus by our team in that particular market. Um, we're still going to consider Edmonton and Calgary and Winnipeg. Those are cities of interest and, you know, they still have um, good opportunities there. But we're not we're not ready for the prairies and we're not ready for the Maritimes. That's way too far for me to fly. Um, maybe one day. Um, well, we've got Ron in Toronto, so he can fly there. Um, we also like the strong secondary markets such as Victoria, Kelowna, and even Nanaimo. And we're going to continue to build on our positions in those markets. And we're very happy with what we have there. But unfortunately, Canada, it's a very small and crowded marketplace with a lot of players. And as opposed to the U.S. market, which is 10 times the size where we see a lot more opportunities. Thanks for that, Mark. Uh, the next question, in light of the return to work effort that companies are undergoing, how has office real estate been impacted and what is the outlook from here? So this is a real pet peeve of mine. And I was really happy to see in the newspaper this morning the uh, um, quote from the chair of, of um, RBC, of Royal Bank, where he was saying it, it's time for people to get back to work and, and it could be under a hybrid solution, but it's a missed opportunity for people to work face-to-face -face and collaborate. So I was very happy to see that. I like to call it return to office as, a, as opposed to return to work. It's been two and a half years since the start of COVID. 
and the office, uh, the the office asset class, especially the high rise towers, not the low rise, they've really been impacted. Um, as most of them are still well below 50% of the companies back to work. So I heard even last weekend that the Ma- uh, Manhattan only has 8% of the companies mm-hmm. back to work. That's really low. So that's that's a concerning trend, and hopefully they that that ramps up. So it's likely to take a really long time before we ever get back to the pre-COVID occupancy levels, or perhaps we never, as many companies will be adopting some form of hybrid solution to be more flexible for the staff, which I fully support. Um, If the economy worsens, I could envision the pendulum swinging back to the middle or even in favor of the employer where they can set the terms on attendance in the office. Um, We are for sure missing an opportunity for younger people so I echo the comments from uh, the chair, the chairman of the World Bank, really to benefit from the energy and collaboration in the office, including the mentoring from senior experienced people. Um, you can't you can't underestimate that those face to face in person conversations. So yet. So despite the fact that people are not back to the office, I'm still amazed at how many companies have continued to pay their rent on their lease commitments in these office towers for the past two and a half years. Um, as many offices are still empty. So it just shows you how resilient real estate can be. So working from home, in my opinion, is not a long-term solution. It's part of the solution, but it's not a long-term solution. And I'm optimistic one day that we will get back to those pre-COVID occupancy levels, or at least get close to it. And I do believe that high-rise office towers will be in for a rough ride. Um, and I can envision a scenario where developers slow or stop the addition of new towers. And I think it's kind of interesting. The only exception might be Vancouver, it could be some other markets where we seem to be thriving and there's because more companies are locating here, driving demand for a new modern space. And I guess the tech sector is really a big uh, part behind that growth. Uh, thanks for uh, walking us through that one, Mark. The next question, you referenced covered land plays and industrial outside storage. Can you explain what those mean and why you were pursuing those? Yeah. Um, it's there are companies in the us that just go after this and it really is to have a built-in pipeline of future development sites but what they are is think of it as a, a prime infill location and it's a tenant who might have a there might be a property with a smaller building on it it could be wash base for their trucks it could be for their office but a big part of the property is actually land where they're storing their vehicles or they're storing their materials and these users and there's a lot of them they need to be close in um, there's also an interesting article that we saw that one day, not today, but one day, when we get to autonomous vehicles, where are they going to park? They're going to want to park in infill locations, right? So that's a kind of an interesting trend, you know, that can happen. So we like these sites. And we're not talking periphery. We're talking about prime infill locations in industrial nodes. And these users, they're getting pushed out because these sites are getting developed. So we like it because there's high demand from the, from this asset type. Uh, next question has your team considered mobile home or rv parks or any other alternative real estate asset class yes we have and uh we've i i don't mind that asset type we are looking at it we've i've talked to some people recently who are very experienced in this area so it's something i would consider um and uh, it's the same thing with like marinas like marinas is just a form of self-storage and we almost bought um um uh, two marinas three or four years ago and in hindsight i wish we we had because but he bought a boat during COVID, and and that business has gone well so we're not afraid to look at sort of um you know alternative asset classes you know self-storage used to be alternative it's not alternative anymore but you know rv could be uh you know uh, marinas we're not afraid of those if we can prove that we can you know we've got security of income and we can get growth uh, the next question, Mark, how is self-storage asset class impacted in a recessionary environment and how did it perform during the pandemic? Um, I've learned a lot since we changed our team two years ago. Like we made a material change. We, we overhauled our entire management team and very fortunate to have a group that, you know, focuses on marketing, staff engagement and customer service and online Google reviews. Huge. So, um, I think self-storage is a good gauge of the economy and we are still um, getting uh, not only rental increases, but occupancy increases. Um, Before this management team came in, 
we were happy if we were in the 90 to 92 percent occupancy range well these stabilized assets now in our portfolio they're in that 97 to 99 percent range and that's still with implementing regular increases now we're obviously going to be careful in this environment not to stress you know the, the the customers too much but i mean it's it's been really resilient and so um we like it think about it when a tenant moves out of their locker you sweep the floor there's no inducements you don't pay brokers i love it there's no you know cash outlay so what you need is you need a really strong team you need good marketing you need a good brand and you need google reviews and um our team has got this thing nailed down so i can scale with this now so we're going to keep going with, with with that asset type Thank you, Mark. The next question, what are the criteria you look for when selecting a new geographic market? So this comes up often and what we typically do before we acquire an asset in that marketplace is we'll, we will do a, our team here, we'll very, do a deep dive into that market to come up with a white paper, if you will, on why we should go to that market. It studies the education, you know, the universities, the, the airports, the Fortune 500 companies, the vacancy rates for the asset class. So if it's industrial, let's say, and we really study that hard to, to build a thesis on why to go to that market. We then submit that to our investment committee and saying, look, we want to go there. We're seeing some opportunities. Here's why are you guys on board? Um, and we get their, their thumbs up before we start going into it. Because if we go into a market, we want to have that cluster strategy. We don't want to just buy one. We want to have many assets so that you can really get a foothold and that, and having that cluster strategy, it, it, it it allows you to create awareness to the brokerage community. So they bring you more opportunities as well. So it works in a whole number of ways, but yeah, we, we typically will, you know, I mentioned those markets, Nashville, Salt Lake, Austin, Reno, we've, we've done those deep dives. We we've done that research. We want to go to those markets when the time is right. And the time will, uh, it will be soon. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we're going to stuff in as many more as we can here. What are the key differences between creative office and conventional office? Okay, so in any asset class, doesn't matter what it is, industrial, like we talked about iOS versus small bay and large bay, retail, same thing, you got neighborhood retail, you got power centers, you've got enclosed malls. It's the same thing in office. You can have an office tower, you can have single story flex office, and you can have a creative office building. And a creative office building would be like what we have in Mount Pleasant, which is like four to five story uh, buildings that are appeal to the tech type community and we've done very well with those assets in the Mount Pleasant area so we really like it and we saw that those assets did not get stressed in COVID in that environment and and so we like we, we will still continue to do that the um, single story has worked well too uh, you don't have to write elevators so it's there so people felt safe so those have performed well for us too in both the US and Canada the office towers is a different topic and we are doing one for ourselves uh, in Vancouver for our, our own head office. And we um, also are building one in Kelowna. So we will selectively do it, but we're not a high rise office tower owner. That's for the pension funds. We are not going to go deep on that asset class. Um, it's amazing how well those assets have performed in this uh, COVID environment where many I'm downtown and there's lots of floors that are empty. People aren't back yet. People still pay the rent. Um, so, but that's just not for us because the high-rise office towers, I think, attract uh, uh, and command a much higher, they command higher leasing fees, tenant inducements, and lease up time. So it will do the odd one, but I'm really not wanting to go deep on, on that one. But the low-rise low, low rise, um, and single story, yeah, we like those. Okay. Uh, the next question I'm going to ask, Mark, and I'm going to uh, stick you to a short timeline on the response so we can fit it in. How is the seniors housing portfolio performing coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, thank you for raising that because I didn't deal with that today and we should have. Um, so here's what happened. Pre, uh, we have five uh, seniors and we bought into this, uh, so we, we invested in this with a partner century group, uh, four of them out in um, Langley and Tawasson. We did that four or five years ago. And then we have another one in, in, in the NIMO. So we have five. So pre COVID, our occupancy levels were 95%, really performing well. And then COVID happened. And our occupancy went from 95 down to 85. And the industry was lower than that. They were 80. So uh, we were frustrated. And so once, once the vaccine rolled out um, last year, um, 
we were hoping that the tours would ramp up and they were they, they they were slower to happen and then when the tours ramped up the commitments didn't happen as quick but they finally kicked in later last year and early this year so i'm very happy to say we're now back to 94 percent, which is amazing and i've talked to other people in toronto who follow this sector closely and said mark you are way outperforming the industry average is still below 85%, closer to 80%. So you are, so maybe we just got lucky. It's the right partner, the right locations, but um, we are doing very well. So would we go buy more? Yes, maybe not right today, but we are looking at it, but yes. But that was a pretty stressed environment going through with COVID because you know, the problem was people didn't want to tour, right? They were afraid. In fact, they were taking their loved one out because they couldn't go visit them. So that was a weird dynamic. So um, I think we'll be ready to do more, but maybe it's next year where we'd look at it closely. Thanks for your time today, Mark. Always great to get your insights. We'll look forward to the next one. And to our audience members, please look out uh, in your inboxes as you'll be seeing uh, the replay for today's recording, as well as the invitations for our events on September 22nd and September 28th. Thanks and bye for now.